Hello, everyone. We are going to go ahead, go ahead and get started because we have a lot of great information to share with you all. Um, I hope you're all having a great day. Um, I am Linda Lathod. I am a program officer at Digital Square. And for those of you who don't know Digital Square, um, we connect health leaders with resources necessary for digital transformation. One of the ways we do that is by supporting global goods and supporting them through um, webinars like this to help them thrive. Our webinar today is focused on communities of practice, which are an excellent way of sharing knowledge and experience, identifying gaps, spurring innovation, um, but the design of these communities can be challenging um, and, and making sure that people are communicating across these communities is, is always an interesting task. Um, so for you guys, we have um, a great panel lined up. We're going to be hearing from Luis Ortiz at Chapaigo, who's going to give us some lessons from public health and communities practice he manages. We'll then hear from Max Kraft at DHIS2, followed by Jamie Thomas at OpenHIE, and then Jen and Tilla at OpenMRIS. Uh, before we get started, just a few house rules. Um, this, this webinar is recorded and will be posted on our wiki, as will be slides. We ask that you mute yourself during the presentation um, so that we can hear the speakers. And then we'll have about 15 to 20 minutes for questions at the end. Um, so what I'll ask is please raise your hand if you have a question. Um, if you're not comfortable raising your hand, please do drop questions in chat and we'll, we'll go ahead and ask them. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to our first speaker, Luis Ortiz, who is a Senior Advisor for Knowledge Management at Japaigo. His core areas of work include learning and documentation for japaigo led projects and programs, strengthening ent enterprise knowledge man management processes and platforms, and strengthening organizational team and individual capacity in knowledge management. He has a master's in anthropology from Georgia State University and an MPH from Johns Hopkins. Luis, over to you. Great, thank you, Rinda, and, and welcome everyone. Thanks for inviting me to this panel. Um, so what I wanna do is share just a few of the lessons from the communities of practice that I've been a part of, both at Japaigo externally and um, at MSH. So if uh, we can go to the, the impetus for support slide, next one. Um, many of you will have seen many of these, these requests um, of, su of support, uh, frantically wanting to, you know, wanting to see how can we get people to participate or why they're not participating, um, or feelings of, you know, we've done this before, or it's organizational culture and we can't change that. Uh, I wanted to put these up here, up here because these are a lot of the, the entry points for actual support for communities of practice, uh, and I like to have it in the back of my mind. Next slide. So um, there were a couple of streams out in the global health community about communities of practice that they're, you know, they're, they're valued. There are many of them. Um, they're, we, we understand that they can provide a unique um, opportunity for learning, um, but there was no one place where we can see where all of the communities uh, focused on global health were found. Uh, and so through two different streams, me, uh, while well, I was at, at uh, Management Sciences for Health, but also um, Neil from HIFA and some other colleagues at USAID Research Health Research Program, um, kind of came together and realized we needed a, a, a platform where we could at least see what the other communities are out there. <laughs> and it, we also found that there was an opportunity for us to learn about the management of COPs. Um, so a lot of the a lot of times it's a, a discussion between the technical leads and the administrators. And we wanted to create a space that was just focused on the issues that COP managers face and how we might learn from each other and um, and improve our practice. And so this here, this is a list of the different uh, communities that are part of this group that's been around for just um, about a year and a half. And uh, we had our fourth meeting. Um, a business meeting just last month. So if you're not familiar with this, please reach out to me afterwards or Vrinda and we can link you in. Uh, next slide. While I was at MSH, one, uh, one of the things that we wanted to do was update the way that we talked about communities of practice, um, not just about 
individuals coming together because they're passionate about learning. But can we make it a little bit more concrete? You know, what are the what are the, the three main objectives of the COPs that we were managing? And we wanted to also take a look to see what is in the literature, the recent literature about what it takes um, to develop a strong and high performing uh, COP. And that's what the triangle there represents. Um, we we read through, uh, I think at the time was five article of uh, five five years of um, COPs and public and public health, and we we took out some of these insights of like, what is needed to actually make them work. And I won't go into them uh, in detail, but you can see that there's a link at the bottom that we uh, we brought together um, this literature review, developed this framework, and then applied it to our to the communities of practice at MSH, and then we had it published in the Journal for Knowledge Management. Um, and I'm happy to talk about that a little bit more um, to see what 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 are these what are these uh, levers of change as we call them? How do they play out in um, in an organization and uh, in support of a COP? Next slide. I love to think about the forces that are supporting your goal and. Uh, things that are kind of restraining you. Uh, maybe you're familiar with a force field analysis to support another barrier, uh, another type of barrier analysis. <clears throat> and I, I won't go through all of these, but you can see that there are some um, uh, driving factors and restraining factors that actually kind of contradict each other. And I think it's really important for COP managers to, to be aware that the requests for support are often um, contradictory. Um, where we want we we want to increase participation, but we also don't want an email load. Um, we want to be able to have to have individuals join because they're interested, but also we want to be able to to collect all of their technical advisors in a specific technical area, so we have um, easy access to them. So using this using this framework and just breaking it down a little bit more, especially for the technical leads, I found to be really you know really helpful and and. Uh, and seeing what needs to change um, or uh, what can we modify um, in order to get to these, you know, the goal of access to information, strengthening networks, and, and, and ultimately um, encouraging informed, uh, informed action. Um, next slide. So I started with MSH about 18 months ago. So I, I onboarded virtually, and um, I have, uh, my role was to, uh, to really support all of our different knowledge management platforms and also our and also a number of different projects. So I had to put some things in the back burner and the COPs was one of those. I came in and I saw that there were over 30 COPs and I made the point to observe what was, what was happening. I wanted to really understand the, the, the cadence of sharing, um, the feelings about um, the feelings about the community before I actually made any um, any changes. And um, so this was a really important um, important aspect of that support. Next slide. So as I mentioned, uh, and you can skip you can skip through the whole thing. Um, there were thirty. Uh, there were some initial actions that I wanted to take to just clean up before we really d dug deep into uh, encouraging participation in, in a more meaningful way. And some of these things were fairly easy to implement. You know, identifying which ones were the inactive communities, identifying communities that were that were that could be merged. The, the difference was too nuanced, uh, so that we can get to um, communities that are more active, nearly active, but also that members join communities that are active. Uh, it can be really discouraging to join a community and not see any action, um, not see any actions or, or discussions happening in that community. And I think it's important for COP managers to have this bird's eye perspective to be able to share. You know, if you're in a community that's not working, let me show you a community that is working, uh, and that's a large part of what um, of what I do. Next step, next slide. This was also the first time that um, the folks at at uh, Chipago we're actually seeing performance data for the communities. Um, and, uh, and you can go to the next slide. So on the, the slide that says the proportion of posts in fiscal year 21, uh, in terms of like uh, of prioritizing my time, for example, or the time of our technical teams, um, having these numbers is really critical, um, especially with so many COPs. Um, so if we're trying to, to, to enact change within our communities, really knowing where the starting point is and not, not feeling that we need to address all of the communities at the same time um, is really, uh, really important for prioritization. Next slide. 
And I mentioned the cadence of, of, uh, of performance. This was looking at, at all, all of the communities, the high, middle, medium, and low performers. And you can see that there is an obvious, uh, an obvious uh, trend in the way that they were sharing over this last fiscal year and it's important as as a baseline you know when i'm supporting my cops if there are improvements that i take i don't take credit for them unless there's something that i did and for this first year i really just want to focus on getting data implementing those minor changes and not necessarily any radical any radical changes um next slide and you can go to the the next one after that um there are a couple of things that, that worked at MSH that I'm trying to bring into Chipaiko, um, forming a distributed governance uh, committee called the, the Technical Exchange Networks Group to make, to, to make joint decisions, um, making sure that there is a good presence in our, um, in our internal intranet, having branding, having a good brand for our COPs, including visual icons for each one of the COPs that could then be integrated into uh, brown bag presentations or internal newsletters to start to show that coherence across multiple different engagement strategies. We also had in-person um, activities for whenever there was an, a, a discussion that really merited some more uh, some more complicated discussions. We brought together it in, um, in our office in Medford, uh, in Arlington, and also community huddles. We had four storytelling events about different issues that emerged from the COP discussion. And again, made a really big push of consistently, per, consi consistently showing our monthly performance data, recognizing individuals who were high contributors in that reporting period um, and, um, and make decisions based on, um, based on that. Uh, so um, when we applied the uh, the frame, the, the performance of the of manage of MSH's technical exchange networks to the framework, um, we were able to, you know, to to really show how each one of these different strategies evolved um, evolved over time, and and we ultimately got to participation of there being about three messages sent through the technical exchange networks every business day. Um, that sounds a, like a lot, but. If you translate that, those are three instances every day that someone in the organization sees something and they want to share it. You know, that is a really important benchmark for um, being an, having an organizational culture that is conducive to sharing and learning. Um, and we wouldn't know that if we didn't have our performance, our performance data. Um, the next slide, sorry, the, um, the circle one. Yeah, okay. Uh, and I know I'm running out of time. So um, one of the things that I've that that I've that I've worked on with members of the COP managers group is really identifying all of the different aspects that go into um, managing communities of practice well. And so we developed this framework, um, critical aspects of virtual collaboration and COP that's not unique to COPs, but it has a lot about it, of all the different things that should be considered. And these are really like tactical management issues, not about the content of the technical content of, of what's discussed and done in that community. And this is a, at this point, I think it's a 15 page document, which has a experience from a wide range of organizations. Um, there was a lot of interesting things that came out during, um, during COVID that are new considerations that I think we're gonna, we, that we do need to take forward even in, in post COVID. Um, and so this is a work in progress and um, so, I'm hoping that we as a group will come together and really start thinking about how to formalize this and, um, and, and disseminate it. Uh, and if you skip to my last slide, um, just in terms of, of next steps for, uh, for JPAIGO, I think it's two slides ne next. So, you know, really pushing for the use of data to buy me some time in order to make good decisions about the COPs is so important. Putting, you know, talking about COPs as in the same way that my health colleagues think about their own interventions. You put, you make these investments, these inputs, you are really good at these kind of middle processes and outputs, and then you contribute to these longer term goals of, um, of learning of learning and action with the appropriate kind of, uh, of M&E or performance plan in order to tell that story correctly. Um, so the, 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 
uh, where I am right now with these uh, with these communities is that we are in our second of four meetings, bringing together to talk about some of the challenges, some of the things that I've observed over this past year, and and um, and performance data. So um, I'm really excited about the about this um, this opportunity to start with very very underdeveloped COPs, and um, and making my mark in this organization. So thank you again for uh, for including me, and I look forward to the discussion uh, piece on this. Thank you. Thank you, Luis. All right, next up, we have Max Kraft from DHIS2. He is the communications and training coordinator for the DHIS2 project and based at the Health Information Systems Program at the University of Oslo. The team's responsibilities include developing and delivering capacity building courses to the DHIS2 Academy program, as well as information sharing and community engagement through the DHIS2 community of practice and other channels. Max, over to you. Hey, thanks, Rhonda, and uh, thanks to everyone for joining us today. It's really great to see so many people here on this call. Uh, I'm joined today by two of my colleagues, uh, Caroline Titulian, uh, who is our head of project support at the University of Oslo, and she's been, a, she's been involved in our community practice project since we transitioned to this course platform and earlier. So she'll talk a little bit about historical background and goals, and then uh, Agassim Sharaf Adin is our relatively newly uh, new team member for us, who's our community practice coordinator. And he's been doing some great work with technical innovations and strategy. So he'll talk a bit about what our current work is. And we're gonna talk about this from a largely operational perspective. So a lot of what we've tried, uh, what's worked, what hasn't worked, what our results have been. Um, but very exciting also to hear more about theory from uh, our other colleagues in this call. But let's uh, get started. Can you go to the next slide, please? And I think, Caroline, if you could talk about uh, the history a little bit and the needs for CP. I will. I hope you can hear me OK. So yeah, I wanted to talk quickly about the background and that rationale for the launch of the DHS2 community practice. So before the COP launched on the discourse platform, which I'll get more into later, there were kind of two main mailing lists we had where a lot of our support and announcement happens, but it was also quite dispersed in a lot of informal channels and other smaller uh, email groups. So like Max mentioned, I was part of a team that conducted sort of a needs assessment and we were looking at different ways and different platforms to, to fill in the gaps that you can see in the table in the slide. Uh, a lot about increasing community engagements, have better crowdsourcing for problems, uh, bridging users and our UIO core team of developers and also move beyond just the mailing list for support issues. So we were very fortunate to receive funding from Digital Square through their notice fee to support the initial design launch and first year of coordination where also we got support from uh, PIPA. Next slide, please. So uh, as already mentioned, uh, some of the purpose of our community practice is to fill the gaps we discovered in the needs assessment. We want it to be a place where people can ask for help and share experiences. There are so many best practices and lessons learned around DHIS2 configuration and implementation that we want people to share. So we want it to be a knowledge base. We want it to be a place for sharing of resources and also a place where, again, users can discuss with our core development team, give feedback on functionality requirements and our roadmap. And we really wanted to gather everything in one place instead of many channels and email lists. And we also make sure to actually import our almost 10 years of knowledge base from these, these two main mailing lists. Next slide, please. So uh, we decided to go with Discourse as a platform, which I think is a familiar platform for many other global goods forums as well. Uh, if we just found it the way it was easier to organize and follow discussions, you could still get email notifications and have it as a mailing list, which was good for people, but it was also more interactive than email. And we made sure to also consolidate some of our smaller email communities. We had one specifically for disease surveillance and one for server management. We again designed it so everything could be in, in one place uh, on Discourse. And we also uh, looked into having the platform available for our other language communities with translations and specific subcategories for this. And so that's a bit of the background. And now I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Alassim, to talk a little bit more of some of the specific design elements. Yes, thank you. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so um, 
let me talk not just more about the design itself as much as my impression as a new user to uh, the DHIC community practice. Like when I first uh, joined the community practice, the like the first thing I would see is I would see how it's designed as uh, kids agrees from one side on the homepage. And uh, that was it, like very nice because I could see colors and how the each category is divided uh, to subcategories. And uh, so it wasn't just like, when I when you go to the, the website, like Academy, yeah, you can see like, oh, uh, there's the Academy, there are uh, MPAG, there are different sites and pages and all that. But here it's like, you have all the information and, and then next to it, you have the latest posts with pictures, profile pictures of the people who are posting. And, uh, uh, so you can find categories. So the community of practice, like you have these categories of uh, for uh, connection, com community, like connecting with others, uh, people of different languages, uh, who speak different languages, and there there are the announcement category. But also on on uh, if you if you click like instead of categories, you can click latest posts. You can see all the latest posts, and you can see. Uh, the users who are contributing and that's when I felt okay now I have this social interaction in the community of practice so uh, the, the, this portrays that you know you can interact with with the staff of the global UIO team and people from the, the global HESP network uh, and then uh, when we implemented like new additions that we made uh, that we changed were like uh, so changing the staff color and uh, that's good because you feel the presence of staff. Uh, you have staff color for posts. Also, like adding banners, uh, you know, icons and all that. So you can add icons and staff color. Uh, they, you know, it's, I learn a new thing every day on this course uh, on the you know the platform and the community practice. Yeah, thank you. And turn it back to Max. Great. Thanks, Agassin. Yeah, I encourage you all to look at our community practice because uh, Agassin has been doing some really interesting stuff there. Um, we'll maybe talk about that towards the end. So I think it's important to also note that when we talk about the community practice per se, it's really a larger community than our website. Our website is a tool for organizing that community and giving them a place to interact. But we also have to keep in mind that there are other ways people interact and we want to facilitate those, facilitate those as well. So we don't want to just limit ourselves to the website, but since that's our primary tool, we're going to talk about that a lot in this presentation. Um, how do we get people there? If we know there is a community that's larger than the website, how do we encourage them to go to that website and interact with it? Um, part of our strategy has been to continuously signpost the community practice forum in any kind of activity we do, whether it's a DHS2 Academy, whether it's a newsletter, um, whether it's our website, we're always linking people there to learn more, to engage, to ask questions. Um, there are links for your documentation, there are links from our webinars. We actually use the community practice as a primary Q&A space for a lot of our webinars. And we've started embedding the video feed directly in it as a test to see if that works. So we can also transform the kind of questions and comments we get into part of our permanent knowledge base instead of losing them in a, in a Zoom uh, chat, for example. And we also promote it a lot internally with our own team in our HISP network to get people to actively post um, stories, to post best practices, to respond to posts. And that's something we're still working on structuring so we can both have metrics about how the engagement works, but also uh, coordinate it more effectively. So we're getting the right people at the right place at the right time. Um, as far as generating engagement, I mentioned the QA um, part. We've also tried out some gamification, badges, polls, voting. We got an app competition at our annual conference. We did the voting on the COP, which allowed us to also limit it to people who were participating in the conference because you had to log in through your user account to access that poll. Um, but it also got a lot of attention on the post and people were interacting with the presentations a lot more than they would otherwise. That was really interesting. Um, we also have that as a primary source for a lot of content, like our software release notes are, are, are posted primarily on the COP and other things like announcements and events also happen there first. So that's a real incentive for people to be present on that forum so they get access to the information. The next slide, next slide please. So some results, uh, we've seen steady growth in COP users over time. Uh, as you can see, we've gone up to around uh, 4,500 uh, since we launched in 2018. Um, there are a couple of really steep uh, climbs there and those are linked to things like our annual conference where we, since we're using that primarily as a communication channel during those events, we see a spike in uh, enrollment at those uh, during those events. Next slide, please. 
And this is trying to graph a little bit more about use. So here on this graph, we have posts in the COP and we have uh, views on the COP. And posts we split out into support, which is our largest category. And that's coming from uh, the COP's origin. This is primarily a technical support mailing list. And then you have everything else. Um, we've had the impression that support really dominates, but when we look at the numbers in this way, we see that it's actually not such a huge difference between how people are engaging with it now. We see that there's still a majority of support posts most of the time, but actually at certain points, the non-support posts really spike. And that also tends to correlate to when reading time spikes. We think there's a lot of interest in people reading the non-support content, although we do see a continuous interest in posting and interacting with support uh, requests. So that's interesting. We'll look into those uh, that data a bit more. Yeah, next slide, please. And just quick user feedback. Um, we got generally positive comments from using this as a uh, as a primary information communication channel at the annual conference. Next slide, please. Okay, these are some comments. We had um, some bachelor students here do a research report on our community practice recently. We got a lot of interesting feedback from them. Um, one quote here that I put that is negative is the bottom left, which was uh, part of what started our focus uh, on community practice, trying to get support questions answered because we had this perception that people would ask questions there easily, but then they weren't necessarily responded to. So we've tried to be a lot better at identifying those questions and then if not answering them directly, because we don't want to be a full service uh, customer support line. We're not, we don't have the staffing for that. We don't think that's really conducive to the community, but at least making people feel heard and helping to develop their questions to the point where other people can step up and answer them. So kind of facilitating the answering of questions, if not necessarily direct, directly answering all questions that are asked. Next slide, please. Okay, some lessons learned. Uh, I'm not going to read through all these because I'm running out of time, but Definitely getting LGCM on board is an important part because having one person's dedicated time on this project is by far the biggest thing to keep it going. Um, things that could be improved, um, you know, we're still working on the non-support related uh, content and definitely the non-English content is also a challenge, but also having dedicated people there has helped our French community be quite active, uh, for example. Next slide, please. Okay, some challenges. Again, staff time. I think everybody knows that you need to actually set aside time for this. And in our case, it's an extended network. That means also letting people bill us for this if we are asking them to do work on the COP by answering questions or providing stories, having that be a billable um, kind of activity uh, for them. And then externally, uh, some, some potential concerns there. It goes back to the sort of trust uh, and, and uh, safety issue I think was raised in Luis's presentation. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, and a lot of experiments. So um, I talked about the YouTube streaming uh, via the COP. That was really fun. We just had a good webinar using that methodology yesterday. Um, formalizing support strategy, tracking posts, tracking responses, um, customizing banners. Our, now home, our banner has now links to different priority areas in the COP so people can go directly to the main uh, entry point and then find the links to the things that we want to direct them to. Um, using metrics more and um, doing single sign-on for popular services. Um, we tried some things that didn't work. There's a, a discourse translation plugin that was quite expensive and not really used. We dropped that. And um, we tried integrating Slack and couldn't find a way to make that work productively. So we dropped that too. And then a few things we're still testing out or want to try. Um, and next slide, please. And that's it. So thanks a lot for your time. Sorry, I went a little bit over, but looking forward to the discussion later on. Oh, good, Max. Thank you. All right. Next up, we have Jamie Thomas with OpenMRS. She is a part of the Global Health Informatic te Informatics team at Martin Streff Institute based in Indianapolis, Indiana. She's a community manager for OpenHIE, a community striving to, to support public health leaders, health advisors, and technologists implementing health information exchange. She's responsible for activities to encourage engagement and build awareness and support in an inclusive community. Jamie, over to you. Thanks, Amanda. I really just want to say thank you for putting this panel together. I'm humbled to be a part of it and hope to continue to, to see uh, panels like this. Um, I'd like to just kind of talk a little bit about what OpenHIE is, what our goals are, um, and um, kind of what we're doing as we're growing and adapting. And on this first slide, you can see um, I had a little quote there around, if you build it, they may come. Um, and, you know, community building is not a science. 
we're all very aware that you're going to make mistakes, but those are opportunities to kind of build something else. It's really great. And so um, I think it's important that we keep our, keep our mind in that, in that phase. And so uh, slide. So one of the things with OpenHIE that we um, had to do was to really, or question, I guess we got asked a lot was, how do you download it? Well, you don't. Um, we are actually a knowledge space. We're not a software. We um, listen and uh, learn through our network. We make connections. We bring people together. Um, and so we've really tried to build this peer learning atmosphere. And um, we really want to know what countries are doing around health information exchange. Okay, so slide. Um, so this is kind of our origin story. This is where we kind of came from. We started out as just a small consortium um, of five or six groups or organizations and individuals who came together to collaborate on a project in Rwanda around the health information exchange. And we were very light. We were phone, phone calls and a free Google site where we kind of did a little bit of everything. Um, and then in 2012, there was a summit in Rwanda and it was sponsored by PEPFAR. It was hosted by the Rwanda Ministry of Health and Genbi Health Systems. Um, they brought together subject matter experts, uh, software organizations to contribute to the refinement and the extension of the architecture work happening um, in Rwanda, which then kind of formed our conceptual architecture. Um, so then in 2013, OpenHIE actually launched as a community of practice. We saw benefit in taking that conceptual architecture and, and sharing that and um, sharing what we had learned going through the project, but also learning from others who were trying to create e-health strategies and architectures as well. And so, you know, for the community of practice, we really went through different phases. We went through, or what I like to call phases, um, we built consensus. We did a lot of alignment around missions and visions and values and what those objectives were and what our secretariat model would look like. Um, we also went and did a lot around supporting and planning um, and kind of adoption around the community of practice. So um, developing things, piloting them, those strategies and those governances, and then continuously learning and adapting from them, what worked, what didn't work, and not being afraid to kind of change, make little minor changes to kind of tweak things and make it better. And then... Um, in, it's not on here, but in 2018, we actually held our first face-to-face -face meeting, which I felt like is, was a big change for our community. So um, historically, a lot of things were just happening online and conversations that way. But being able to meet face-to-face -to, -face to showcase um, strategies and approaches around components um, and how that empowered standards-based sharing for health information exchange just made a huge difference. And so We've um, held meetings in Tanzania and Ethiopia in 2019. Um, unfortunately, with COVID, we haven't been able to be together in person since then. Um, but we are next month in October, hope, hoping to, uh, well, we are hosting a virtual meeting and we hope to be back together in 2022 in Malawi. So um, I think that those face-to-face -face interactions um, are something that we all look forward to and are big moving points in our community. Um, and then <clears throat> in 2019, when we were in Ethiopia, I, there felt to be this shift of, okay, you don't download OpenHIE. Um, we, we got the message out. And so there was really this building on of awareness and, um, and understanding where and how the architecture is being used. That was our next big thing. We wanted to understand how countries we're using the architecture. And so we wanted to bring those stories forward. And so we started doing outreach and, and using our network to kind of figure out where are people using OpenHIE? What kind of impact is it making? And so those led to stories that we now have out on our website um, called Impact Stories. Um, uh, slide. Okay, and so um, this is the architecture that we all come to our community for. And so this is, this is our shared interest. Um, but, um, and if you could just click real quick, our community is not just about 
and architecture and about that, but it's about the people. Uh, if you could advance it. And so we're a di diverse community. We're made up of um, MOHs. We have governing bodies, uh, implementers, funders, domain experts, um, developers, end users, standards development organizations. So we're very diverse in the, the type of people that come um, to our community. And in fact, um, there's 70 plus different organizations and individuals that um, come to OpenHIE to interact and to network. Um, and one great thing is, is, is the people and the people want to walk alongside projects and they want to learn what countries are doing and how they can help support real world needs. So they really wanna hear those stories. Um, and that's really where we are now is really understanding where countries are at um, and how we can better support them as a community and what they really need. Um, not what we think they need, but what they really actually need. Can you advance? And so I don't know if you guys have ever heard of KISS method, but um, it, it can be said in a different way, but I really liked the way this was said, let's just keep it super simple. Um, and this is from a software engineer in Nigeria who said this. Um, and so when we started out, we were three people um, and in our secretariat. And so we had simple tools. We had phone calls. We had a wiki where we would all kind of meet and coordinate ourselves. And then we had mailing lists. We had lots of mailing lists. <laughs> um, and we had a website that was relatively simple, but we could point people to it and say, this is what OpenHIE is about um, and, and give them a little bit more information. Um, if you could just advance. So some of the things that we've happened and, and learned from as we've grown and adapted is really, again, that alignment on mission, vision, and values. As, our, as your community kind of grows, things are gonna change. And so making sure our community members see themselves in the mission and vision and revisit that um, at different times is really important. And we've been able to um, develop a partnership program to shine a light on organizations that align with our mission, actively participate in the community and demonstrate interest in driving the mission forward. Um, keep things uncomplicated. When OpenHIA first started, it was a handful of organizations helping to navigate the direction of the community and operationalize it. Um, now we've formed a steering committee um, that's made up of um, country leaders and they help to give strategic guidance to our leadership um, around community priorities. And that helps us to just focus on, okay, how can we operationalize these recommendations and support working groups um, to do that? Um, something else is connecting with stakeholders where they are. Um, you know, not one forum might not work for everyone. Um, and so if it's not, how do you engage people in those gaps? Um, you know, write down who all your stakeholders are and get to know them. Where are they hanging out? Are they in other networks? Are they on other forums? Are they using other communication tools that maybe you aren't using yourself? Um, and are there ways to speak directly to them there? Um, building relationships. We are huge on doing outreach. I spend every day doing outreach and, and make it part of my day to day. Um, when we formed the steering committee, we were introduced to a digital health network in Latin America and how they are, um, now they're one of our formal partners and they help us to make connections in that region that we didn't have before. Um, as well as that, um, they're also going to be helping us to translate some of our resource materials. And that's one way that they want to help to contribute um, back into OpenHIE as well as get things out of it. Um, creating a communication strategy, keep it super simple, start and just add to it along the way. I think sometimes we get boggled down and just trying to, to think of everything, but if we just keep it really simple, um, you know, what are your goals? Are you trying to inform of something, request something, persuade people to do something or just build relationships? You know, again, write down those audiences and what do you want to tell them and how can you reach them? Um, one big thing that we've made sure to do is keep an editorial calendar, checking it frequently, um, and, and um, how you can highlight those in your community and the work that they're doing. Um, 
is, is a big thing as well. Um, I'm gonna try to wrap this up. So no siloed information sharing. So um, our community is a knowledge space. And so we look for ways to maximize exposure and make things easily accessible. So again, we had lots of mailing lists. We tried moving to a community forum. Um, we created new user-friendly tools for assets. So we have something called the OpenHA Academy, where it prompts learning and capacity development. It's a virtually self-paced um, courses around HIE and HIE-related topics. Um, we have a new platform for our Getting Started Guide and our specification. We're looking at ways to better utilize our implementation network. So it's a network that we've had for a while, but we have to, um, we have to continually be thinking about new ways to do it and, um, and how to best uh, bring people in and keep them engaging and sharing the challenges that they have. Um, and really this outreach to like-minded networks to share what is happening. So, you know, groups like the people that are on this call, you know, what networks do you have and how can you best utilize the sharing of information? Um, and so knowledge sharing is hard. So that's my, my summary, but it's totally worth it. And so, you know, people are listening. And I know as community managers, we tend to think nobody's listening. You know, we've created this thing and then you don't see anything happening on it. And oh gosh, nobody's listening, but people are listening. People are doing the work um, and they typically want to share what they're doing, um, but they just need clear pathways on how to do that sharing. And sometimes need that personal touch of just outreach um, and, and making those connections to help them move things along faster. Um, and so uh, I will leave it there, slide. Um, I'm happy to talk to anybody at any time. Um, and so these are a couple of ways just to, to find me online. Thanks, Brenda. Awesome, thank you, Jamie. All right, next up we have Jennifer Antilla. Um, she first became interested in building communities of practice as a part of the team setting up a virtual COP for public health logisticians. Um, a few years later, she learned about OpenMRS and became involved in building local capacity to support its rollout in Kenya. In her current role as Director of Community for OpenMRS, Jennifer now works with the community on strategies that will give people and partners tangible ways to engage and contribute bolster technical capacity and create an environment where everyone can share, champion, and collaborate on solutions that benefit country level open MRS implementations. Over to you, Jennifer. Thanks. These are such wonderful uh, presentations. I, I, I think I have the disadvantage of going last. So hopefully I'll reinforce some of the wonderful points that my colleagues have, have shared. Um, so many of you I'm sure are familiar with open MRS as a software um, and and as a community, and we really are both. We're, we're software and we're, we're a community. And our community is really focused on uh, coordinating and kind of harnessing all of the people who are passionate and interested in building and maintaining um, the OpenMRS software that so many countries um, rely on to manage patient data. So I wanna talk a little bit today about um, our context, where we came from, and where we are today in terms of um, our community and some tips, tips that I think have led to our success. So um, OpenMRS started about 15 years ago. Um, and this slide really only shows data from implementation data from the last five years, five, six years since we've started collecting data. But you know, you think about it, and OpenMRS started in a couple of countries with two or three organizations. And now today, OpenMRS is implemented in over 40 countries in more than 6,500 sites and is managing data for more than 12.5 12 million um, patients. And this is all self-reported data. So of course, there's, it's probably underestimated. Um, but what about our community? Like I mentioned, we started with two or three organizations um, and we've had you know, a, steady, a steady and yet small number of people who have been um, active on, I would say, a daily basis. So, so those of you who are familiar with some of those metrics, we talk about daily active users. It's held steady around 18 um, for a long time, and it's been, but it's been changing. And that's because our community has been changing. The same model that we used 
um, when we started out 15 years ago is, is not necessarily going to work for um, a community that has grown in the ways that we have to support so many implementers. So we're now seeing collaboration essentially unleashed. Um, we're seeing more and more opportunities for people and organizations to come together and collaborate on solutions that really have meaning for them. Um, and then we're seeing more and more organizations come to the community wanting to contribute. And all of these organizations are, and the community are starting to ask for more community support. So as I said, we might have had two or three organizations 15 years ago. Um, in the last couple of years, we've, had, we've seen maybe six or seven organizations come and start to work on, on distinct solutions for them. And we're providing them with some community support that's growing now to 13. I don't know how many we, you know, I haven't done 2021's data yet, so we'll see where we are in 2021. Um, but I'm really optimistic that we're going to move even further ahead. Um, and in terms of just, you know, how many people are active on a daily basis, like I said, we might have started, had like 18, held around 34 for a number of years. Now we're actually up around 52 people being actively engaged in our community on a daily basis. Um, and it's absolutely incredible to see. So how exactly have we managed this? Um, I'm gonna go through what, what might be five tips for, for success and give like a brief example for each one um, to give you an idea of, of how, we've, how we've made this work. So next slide, please. First tip, can you move to the next slide? Trust our values. Um, I keep coming back to this time and time again. You know, we're a user, we're user centered, we're open and we're community driven. So what does that mean today? Next slide, please. When it comes to being user centered, um, we're making sure that our squads and our community are grounded in the priorities of implementers um, and those implementers who are actually contributing to our, our squad. And I'll get to that, what squads are in a minute. Um, and we also make sure that, that country level goals are informing our community direction and are linked to what those squads are doing so that we're making the chain from what implementers, what countries want to what implementers need to what the squads are working on. Next slide, please. We're open. We really try to use communication channels and tools that are freely available and easy for everybody to access. We don't want to create any unnecessary walls or barriers to, to participation. Um, and we're really trying to have, again, those country level goals inform community decisions, uh, community direction and, and link them to squad priorities. Next slide, please. Community driven. Everything you know, is, is, is kind of centered around this, this more distributed um, model of community um, and how individual members can either follow their own flight path putting people in the, in, the, in the driver's seat. What, what do they want to work on? Where do they want to uh, contribute? How can we help them find the right project for them to work on the community based on their interests? So how do we make that easy? Um, and now we're actually looking at um, having those squads not only drive the priorities, but making sure that the squads um, and the implementers on those squads are determining their approach their timelines, their deliverables. So there's no, there's not like a central group that is telling squads what to work on and what to do when. We really want to see this come from the squads up. Next slide, please. So the next tip is align our engagement strategy with our community model. Next slide. Um, the OpenMRS community has been, has been changing. Um, so really we had success for a long, long time, but with more and more people becoming involved, um, our community model had to adapt and change. So what we're seeing now and what we've really tried to do over the last three years is move, move to a model that, that distributes decision-making authority to smaller groups um, and, and enabling and in integrating implementers more and more into our community so that we, we kind of bring together the people who want to, to work on our core technology, our platform, and those who also want to work on uh, features and solutions to shared, shared problems and priorities. Next slide, please. 
So this is where, you know, we've taken some time to really thoughtfully update our community model. And this is where, you know, squads come in. We have squads who are essentially um, small groups of people who have a shared priority, a shared problem. They want to work on it together. Um, there's usually two or three implementers engaged in that, in that squad, and they are working on, on a solution together. So that could be sharing knowledge, that could be coordinating their work, and, and it could actually be working on something together. And then we have um, committees and teams that kind of help provide some overarching alignment. Next slide, please. So as you can see here, um, what we're actually trying to do with our engagement strategy for a particular squad, for example, is to attract and retain um, talent through onboarding for individuals through our flight paths, Google Summer of Code, and fellowships. Um, and you see here a squad here, we have three, three community developers who have um, come up through Google Summer of Code, a couple who have now have fellowships participating in the squad. Next slide, please. And then we're also helping organizations fill uh, critical, those really critical squad roles so that, so that squads have something to find to work on and, and can drive it forward. Next slide. Oh, sorry, next slide. Um, Next tip, choose shared tools and guidelines that will allow for both autonomy and collaboration. Um, I think this was really, this is really crit critical. Um, we don't necessarily have any prescribed um, approaches to how a squad must run, um, but we do have community tools and community conventions. Um, our code of conduct, conduct our communication channels, uh, channel conventions, our decision-making playbook, we have tool, shared tools like JIRA and GitHub, um, our style guide and Zeppelin. And our expectation is that these will um, set the state that squads will use this to kind of figure out how they want to work together in their, in their squad. And it may vary a little bit from squad to squad, but everybody's going to kind of follow these same conventions across the board. Um, and then what I found is that when people ask, how do I contribute? How do I make this squad work? It's easier to kind of give them some examples rather than say, do A, then B, then C. And then that kind of gives the squad the autonomy they want to make their squad work themselves. Next slide. Um, so recognize contributions that have value and impact. This has been on my mind a lot because it is so critical um, to, kind of, to not only maintaining engagement, but also kind of helping people see where they can go in the community and how, how they can become a, a well-respected contributing member of the community. So we're trying to encourage both sustained and positive contributions through a variety of ways. It's as simple as liking a meaningful talk or Slack post, even merge pull requests, I think are a way of encouraging contribution is saying, hey, you did, you did great work, we're gonna include it. Um, we have community roles that we periodically give to people and, you know, here's our list of the different ways that we, that we try to encourage and recognize, um, contributions. Next slide, please. And then the fifth and final tip, um, is, is really one that we're seeing more and more, um, gaining more and more importance in this year, this year especially. That, that there are actually core community roles that are essential to sustainability, to engagement and collaboration. So what does this actually look like? Um, you know, once again, we have this, this squad. This is one of our squads, the Dictionary Manager Squad. Um, I've talked about how we have community members on this squad. We have organizations on this squad, but we also have um, people who provide community support. So this is people like Grace Potma, our director of product, um, myself providing community management. Um, and then we also have a, a product management fellow who supports that squad as well. And, and all of us together, I think really make that squad work. Um, and part of this, part of this too, you know, I've mentioned pretty, you know, pretty soft skills, um, roles like product management, community management. Um, the reality is though that we do think there are key technical roles that need to be filled. And when those roles are uh, include um, almost 
capacity building or mentorship responsibilities, then we think that that is going to be our our key to maintaining um, and build and maintaining and sustaining our community. So these are our five tips, um, what we think has actually contributed to our success. Um, I think over the last year, just, you know, five tips, five things that have that we've we've seen come out of these um, efforts. Um, one of our squads is, is well on our way to building a new front end for OpenMRS. The Dictionary Manager Squad has released a Dictionary manager, Management web app. Um, we've seen an OpenMRS Academy come out of the squad and a new website. Um, so it's really been a, a amazing to see the community evolve and see so much contribution um, and collaboration happen with new people and new organizations. Thanks. Thank you, Jen. All right, we've gone a little over, but I've chatted with many of our speakers. It sounds like we can stay a little bit longer um, if, if there are questions, but I just wanted to open it up. I know there are quite a few questions in chat. Someone with my name also has a great question around, around um, multilingual global communities. I'm gonna guess that's Saurav, if you wanna read that question out loud or, or jump in. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and read it for you. Um, so for the team, uh, there's a question around different language groups within COPs. So Luis, you had mentioned this under Restraining Forces. Max, you also mentioned it in the Francophone group. Um, in the open MS community, a COP around open source solution to manage health and social protection schemes. We just started a Francophone, Francophone group next to our regular English calls with implementation developers. Any advice on how to best facilitate knowledge sharing between these groups without building two separate language chapters? I'm gonna ask Louise to jump in first and then Max and see those are specific call outs. Um, yeah, um, no, it's a great question and it's definitely a, a, a major challenge in our work, um, especially since, uh, you know, in the JPEGO's work on reproductive and maternal um, maternal health, um, some of the lowest indicators are um, are in francophone speaking countries, and yet we don't really have the the capacity and headquarters for an entire support team to be francophone to work with those um, work with those uh, with those countries. So it's a huge challenge. In terms of the COPs, um, I don't have a great response for that, but I do for um, other other knowledge sharing activities. Um, uh, we, we had a, a recently we had a virtual marketplace that was all in French and from everything from the moderators to the Zoom support to all of the planning materials. And the reason I share this is that um, there was a lot of pushback in headquarters for a all French activity that didn't have simultaneous translation. Um, and I think that that when we, when we, you know, making the case for these kinds of activities that are not in English, um, it's really important to, uh, to have data to support why it is that we're doing it in this way. And I was able to show with my team that um, the previous uh, marketplace experiences, you know, we looked across the countries that the Pico works in, um, there, you know, the vast majority of countries that did not participate in any kind of global forum were our francophone countries. Um, and so creating that space and making it truly for the, uh, for those colleagues for sharing and not necessarily for us to observe them sharing or for us to understand what they're sharing, uh, but really a space for them uh, was really, you know, really quite effective. Um, and after this marketplace, two of our francophone countries that didn't even register um, in terms of participation, took the uh, the first and second lead. Um, so yeah, I think it's a, I think it's really really important challenge, and there are definitely some uh, logistics and um, project support issues that need to be considered to make that happen. Awesome. Thanks, Louise. Max. Yeah, um, I wouldn't say we have a perfect solution to this, but we've tried a few things that have worked all right. Um, I think like any managerial problem, you have to prioritize a bit. Um, kind of like Luis was saying, as a leader of observing data, you pick what's active and what's most uh, impactful and you focus on that. And so for us, I think what DHS2 is used in a large number of languages, we know what our priority languages are based on the volume of countries 
with those languages using the system, our relationships with our local HISP groups that facilitate implementation and provide support. So we kind of have a small subset like French and Portuguese and maybe going more in the direction of Spanish that are our key languages we try to focus on with French being by far number one. And again, it's driven by the actual interest in use. Um, so to make our community more um, active or to help that community grow and get response, we have a colleague of mine who is our liaison for the French community from our headquarters and she runs regular webinars, which are kind of like both informational and conversational to provide a space for that community to interact with each other, give us feedback. Um, we recently launched a new website, which has much better multilingual support. And so we've been trying to translate our key content into French, including some content that is French first. So when she is leading those webinars, she will sort of keep an ear out for stories that could be useful to share with other implementing groups, get those written in French and then translate them into English to be a resource for other people. Um, we've been really trying to get better about translating things like our release notes for software packages, um, other major announcements. We have French versions of our academy program that operate fairly regularly. We just launched two new online courses in French. Um, so, you know, we're still far behind the amount of content we have in English, but we're doing a lot better and we're trying to, and part of that is allocating resources and time once you've decided what your language priority is based on the number of people who are in your community who need that uh, content or need that support. Jamie. Yeah, I just wanted to kind of reiterate what Max and Louise were saying. You know, we um, we're just dipping our toe into this a little bit, and um, with our um, our group called Retains out of Latin America, who um, you know we were able to look inside of our community at, as its its current state and find those who said, "Hey, your you know Latin America Retains is asking you to do a presentation about Open HIE to." to, um, you know, to do this knowledge share. And so we looked inside of our community and said, hey, there's this opportunity and, and people raised their hands and said, I would love to have that opportunity. Um, so I think just really looking within your community too, because limited, we do have limited resources, right? We you can't be everywhere. Um, but if you can grow that within your community, you know, people get more engaged. They feel as though they are, you know, it may not be code, but they are making a contribution and, and being that champion for your community. So I think that that's a huge thing for, for building um, empowerment for those people in the community as well. Thank you. Any other questions? Louise, that's a great point about being clear about the denominator. Um, making sure that you're not looking at the entire workforce for a subset um, of, of, a, of, a, of a language group or a culture. Any other questions? We've got a few more minutes for those of us, for those of you who are able to stay on, so. In that case, I'm going to ask, since I've got this wonderful brain trust, I am going to ask one question that, that we came up with together. Um, but how do you guys encourage appropriate conversations? And what approaches do you use for supporting that interaction? I'm going to turn it over to Jen first. Sorry to call on you, but <laughs> you can go from there. Oh, that, that's okay. Um, we do it a couple of different ways. I think it kind of depends on um, what we want to achieve. So. So if we have a, commu a community member might, might come and try to start a conversation, um, you know, we know there are some tried and true experts in our community and sometimes they kind of hold off on making comments so that others can chime in. Um, so we kind of think about how we can strategically call on our experts. The other thing that we've done um, very successfully is, especially when we want to advance a specific topic is have somebody um, put out a very thoughtful post um, with a proposed, like a proposed technical approach um, or here's what I want to do. And, and again, that's something that people can, can contribute to. Um, we found that in the, in the days ahead of that, in the weeks ahead of that kind of a post, if we can have a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversations with people who might not usually be on our talk forum, um, we can at least get feedback on that approach and then encourage them to, to respond. 
can. Thanks, Jen. Open up to the rest of my, my speakers. Any thoughts? Curious if Augustine has any comments from our DHS2 forum. Um, I can just share, you know, I think that continu continuing to emphasize the, the COP as one of many engagement uh, modalities that, they, that we have, um, and that this is an informal space uh, where there are no, you know, not necessarily any right or wrong answers, even though there might be. But uh, I, I think that I think the point that Jennifer um, brought about holding experts back is really important. And I think that that's something as community as COP managers, what we need to make sure that we that we do that, and that the tone of the responses from our from our technical experts are really about inviting this these kinds of discussions rather than just of. Um, you know, knocking it down. And again, if it's put into this broader system of engagement and say, if you want to talk really, you know, really um, uh, specifically about like the new technical guidelines or whatnot, you know, maybe the community of practice is just one of those areas where you talk about those things, um, um, but you should have more formal, you know, report outs or, or communications about those more technical issues. It's really important. Excellent, thank you, Louise. Alcazine? Yes, um, so you wanted me to answer the question? Like, uh, yeah, from, well, from my experience, what I've seen, like, uh, one of the good things that we, we know that, uh, for example, when a, a member is a new member, there's a notice at the top of the post that this is a new, a new member. So it's good that we start by welcoming new new, uh, new members to the community, like starting the post with uh, welcome, welcome to the community. And uh, it's like, uh, becomes more of a uh, general attitude that everyone has, because you know when, you, when you're doing that yourself, everyone else starts doing that, as well as like uh, giving likes. There's also a nice thing, like when you uh, give a number of likes, you get a badge. When you, um, you know, when you get, uh, when you create a topic, you have more visits, you get a badge for that. No, I think badges also help. Um, for example, if someone uh, replies to a uh, problem and it's a solution, they can, their post can be uh, uh, selected as solved. So, you know, when, when I'm solving like, uh, other people's uh, posts, we have it like, like they can click solved on my post. Yeah, the another thing that we did that's like not in the platform itself, but uh, is to uh, pay attention to users who are helpful and uh, mention them in the uh, COP monthly that we have, like uh, users who uh, uh, helped other users, uh, users who created the uh, DHIS to Jira issues, like. To mention their uh, usernames and tag them, as well as like mentioning the most active users, so it kind of like uh, shows them, you know, that there is this interaction, but also that uh, they're solving uh, other people's issues. They're getting bads. They're getting likes. Uh, yeah, and that, so ninety nine percent of the time, the really thoughtful conversations, and um, you know, it, it, sometimes. It, rarely ever do you get like a spam kind of post but it's like uh, automatically generated which is most of the time it's just deleted by the system but uh you know users who come to the community like seeking support and seeking to connect with others uh, being role models in the community from the staff and uh you know to, trying to add emojis and everything, like screenshots also, like uh, so most of the, the, you know, global UI staff, the core team, when they're answering posts, and if it requires a screenshot, they actually add a screenshot. When they answer, they answer, uh, you know, in a very current way, not just a, you know, short answer or, you know, so they, they feel that the, the person who's answering is, you know, thoughtful and really uh, taking the time to understand what the other uh, user is facing with the issue. 
So I think uh, there are many approaches that we can do. Uh, and there's always a way to learn, you know. I would just add one one bit on to I guess Alexander's comment I thought was you know, quite good. Um, this is part of the, the work that he's doing with our internal teams, which is that it's really, I think, helpful to give people a personal invitation to participate in a way that is aligned with their skills or interests. Um, and that leads them to contribute, I think, more readily. If you say, hey, I saw this topic that I think you, it would be great if you looked at this maybe help this person out doing that on a personal basis um, which is easy to do for people we work with on our team but it's something we're working on getting better with with other community members i think it makes it more likely that they will um, have that personal interest in doing so and then we still more engaged and, and better response so that's something we're um, we've been doing a bit mostly internally but we're trying to expand on um... yeah and can i also add one thing uh, also, Max, uh, as he writes the uh, DHI student newsletter, monthly newsletter, and then like the the topic that gets more views uh, in during the month is mentioned in the uh, in the newsletter. I think that also like encourages others. Maybe like uh, if I create a good topic, I'll get you know I'll also be mentioned in the monthly newsletter, which which is like uh, read by users around the world and. Very encouraging. Yeah, it's, it's excellent. Yeah, it's it's really important in this space to have the, those personal connections and encourage people to to speak out when you when you see cool topics and, and things that you find other folks will find interesting. Um, I think we are now at time. Thank you everyone for joining us, and I want to thank all of our speakers here to sh about sharing their their wonderful lessons learned, sharing their experiences. Um, I know I certainly learned a lot. I hope everyone that joined us did as well. Um, so thank you very much and have a great day, everyone. Thanks guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Looking forward to the next panel. <laughs> bye. 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 bye.